We do just want to let you know that we will be talking about some very mature themes in this episode. What did you think was going to happen, right. dude? Hello and happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. This is the Book Isn't Necessarily Better, a library podcast from the Community Library Network in Northern Idaho. I am Roxanne. I'm Michaela. And in this podcast, we read books and we compare the adaptations made for them today. Mm -hmm. And boy, are we excited about today's episode. Yes. Nerd alert. (laughs) Super nerd alert, guys. Sorry. (laughs) In advance. We are doing Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Yay. We're going to jump in and talk a little bit about Frankenstein's creator, Mary Shelley. Maybe a lot of it. But a lot of it about Mary Shelley. She's my hero. Okay, okay. I, am I in love? I, I might be. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's been dead for almost 200 years, so that may be a problem for I'm you. I'm in literary love. Okay, that's fine. Mary Shelley. Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley mm-hmm. was born in 1797. She is the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft who wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Women. She essentially is the mother of Western feminism. Absolutely. This lady. (laughs) It was incredible. (laughs) I think that some humans are just born completely knowing their own mind and Mm -hmm. not willing to have any conventions. She might be like the most out-of-time person Mm -hmm. I've learned about. So this woman, like I said, was a writer, so she was famous in her own right. (laughs) <laughs> Mary Wollensonecraft. She believed in the concept of free love, which essentially means having sex before marriage and that that is okay. So it doesn't necessarily mean you know, like you're not dating out a there bunch of people. Everybody. It can mean that, but right. in this time, free love meant outside of marriage. Sure. She fell in love with an, a married American man hmm. and she had a daughter named Franny. When this American man left her, and didn't want anything to do with her and her daughter. She tried to kill herself by jumping off a bridge. Wow. And filling her her pockets with stones. And so she's sort of recovering from huh. this traumatic experience. So she was a woman, like, a very, like, intense passions, clearly. Right. And she met this man named William Godwin, who also was a famous writer. He also believed in the concept of free love. And they got together... They sort of were like this power couple of, like, think of them as like bohemian sort of hippies. Like, they live by their own conventions. Mm -hmm. She got pregnant again, and she had a daughter, Mary. But what's funny (laughs) is that even though they were against marriage, they they decided to get married when Mary was pregnant with Mary (laughs) in order to legitimize her. Can you say that five times fast? Probably not. No. (laughs) You know, you can have your beliefs, but sometimes you end up doing the thing. (laughs) Right. (laughs) This is super tragic, though. She had Mary, and Mary Wollenstone Craft died 11 days after she had Mary Shelley. This was a huge part of this little girl's life. Mm -hmm. So Mary Shelley learned her alphabet. Now, this is (laughs) super macabre. She would hang out at her mother's gravestone and she learned her alphabet by tracing the letters on her mother's tombstone. That's kind of yes, it is macabre, but that's but like super the like goth perfect and perfect Victorian <laughs> gothic sort of like origin story. Yeah. So this is the Regency era when she's growing up. Yeah, so she's this this goth little girl basically. She's super smart. And then her dad gets remarried and her stepmother is like a typical evil stepmother Mm -hmm. trope and they fought and at one point mary pushed her stepmother in an argument she got sent away to live in scotland right but when she was there like she flourished with her sort of foster family and Mm -hmm. got really close to them and they nurtured her literary mind when she came back this is when things get really interesting so mary has her stepsister who's the daughter of her stepmother she doesn't like. Her name is Claire Claremont. 
and also was a child out of wedlock, which was scandalous in that time. Mm -hmm. So Claire and Mary become thick as thieves. And one day, a poet named Percy Shelley comes to be an intern. I don't know what the... He came to like study under her dad, William Godwin. Percy Shelley comes and is sort of like a boarder at their house. He's trying to like learn everything he can from William Godwin. Percy Shelley is really rich. He, he's not famous yet, but he is a genius. He's an anarchist. <laughs> he's super progressive. A way I heard it described is like, imagine if like two rock stars, so Mary <laughs> Wollstonecraft and William Godwin had a daughter. So she was growing up as like a famous kid, mm -hmm. a literary famous kid. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's interesting. And so there's some debate, like maybe he was attracted to Mary because he was actually like in love with the works of Mary Wollstonecraft. But either way, 21-year-old Percy Shelley falls in love with Mary, who's who is 16. And they're like, well, you know, this is great because even though, uh-oh, Percy Shelley is already married. Mm -hmm. He's 21 and has already been married for five years to a woman named Harriet that he also like ran away with when she was a teenager. He mm -hmm. has a daughter, but he was like, but no problem because your dad is like super chill <laughs> with like not having to get married. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they go and they're like, isn't this cool? And he's like, absolutely not. Get out of my house. You're never seeing him again. <laughs> and she's like, oh my God, you're not even living up to your beliefs. And he's like, I don't care. Get out of my house. Right. It's different when it's my own kid. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, basically. <laughs> And so he kicks her. Well, she runs away, essentially. Yeah, they elope. Uh -huh. But they have no plans to get married. Right. So basically, she goes and lives in the slums with him because his parents cut him off, too. This is very much like a... And they really don't like her. No, they don't? At all, no. Really? I his, didn't know that part. Yeah, his dad refused to even like talk to her for years and years and years. Um, he refused to financially support her after Percy died. And he wouldn't even let her like onto the estate like after Percy. Oh, yeah. Wow. Anyway, it, it'll get interesting. Mm -hmm. Like that whole thing is super weird. Yeah. So she runs away with, with per and they have no money. So they're living mm -hmm. in the slums. And when she's running away, Claire Claremont was like, take me too. You can't leave me here. <laughs> <laughs> and guess who she ends up with? Byron. Lord Byron. I wouldn't say ends up with. We'll get no, there. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there too. But it's a whole interesting um, love yeah. square and I want to cite some of my sources yeah. for all of this information. <laughs> good. That's probably good. Uh, actually, a lot of information comes from a really great movie that I've seen a couple times that I would suggest you watch, Michaela. I okay. can't tell you what to do, but <laughs> I don't like Elle Fanning. I don't really oh, have no, any... Oh, no. She's the worst. I don't have strong opinions about her, but Listen. it is a it's a really well-made movie. It talks about her life. It's called Mary Shelley. It came out in 2018. And this is a documentary? No. Or... It's, it's a movie, but... So I'm not just going off uh -huh. this movie. Okay. I also did a lot of background research. <laughs> Mary Shelley herself gave an account of these years mm -hmm. in her 1831 uh, revision of Frankenstein. So she wrote about it in the beginning, sort of what she was doing at this time of her life. I also, there's a really great young adult biography called Mary's Monster mm -hmm. that is also a graphic novel and it's really beautiful. And it's written in poem. Yeah, but in the end, they actually have really drawn out author's notes about right. their life. Where was I? So Claire Claremont, her stepsister is like, you were taking me too. She's also a teenager. So the three of them run off. Mary gets pregnant. She has a baby. She loses it. She is completely bereft. She's like 17 at this time. Mm -hmm. So this is 1816. It's said that Claire Claremont probably was maybe a little jealous or wanted to be Mary Godwin, mm -hmm. soon to be Mary Shelley. I also want to reiterate that Percy Shelley would become a rock star of yeah. poetry. But so Claire probably kind of wanted to be Mary. I mean, she's mm -hmm. a genius. She had, Mary had already started to write stories. She really, it was clear that she would become very talented. I mean, think about how she grew up. And so Claire's like, well, you have a poet. I want <laughs> Where do I get one of those? So she <laughs> finagles an introduction to Lord George Gordon Byron, who is like the rock star of the rock stars of poetry. And he was super handsome. Google him. But also like the bad boy of the literary scene. Oh, he totally was a bad boy. Yeah. So all of these people are under 25 mm -hmm. when this is happening. Yeah. <laughs> she kind of invites herself, Claire does, mm -hmm. to Byron's summer villa in Geneva, Switzerland. 
This is, is also it? romantic. I know. It is in Switzerland. This is in 1816. What's really weird and super goth is that this was called the year with no summer. Did you know about this? No. So there was this volcanic explosion that actually changed the weather patterns all over the world. And so it like messed with crops that year. There were droughts, but then also floods in different parts. And so when they're in Switzerland, it is just, it's rainy and cold the entire time. Hmm. And so back in the day, if you went to visit somebody, because it's so hard to get there, you would stay for like a couple of months, maybe. That's my worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so in this big villa, well, it's actually, there's a villa and then they're staying in like a little guest house. Right. But, a little mother-in-law. Yeah. Yeah, basically. <laughs> so in this villa, you have Byron, super famous, 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 rich. And then you have Claire Claremont, who is now sleeping with him, but he's like, whatever in fact there's there's a quote (laughs) he says later he's like i never said i loved her and then he basically says like what was i supposed to do she was throwing herself at me wow he was like i don't love her like i don't owe her so she gets pregnant and he's like i don't owe you anything (sighs) yikes yeah yeah he takes her baby (laughs) yeah 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 uh and and pays for the support but he Mm -hmm. didn't really want anything to do with her no this reminds me a lot of the balloon sisters totally a lot Mm -hmm. yeah There has been some speculation that Shelley and Claire had an affair when uh, Mary was depressed after the death of her baby, but they're not sure if that confirmed, but they were really close. And at this point, his wife had, Shelley's wife, Mm -hmm. yeah, Harriet, uh, actually had killed herself by jumping into a river with stones in her pocket. Okay, guys, stay away from big rocks. She has um, also killed herself, and so they have actually gotten married at this point. I don't think they're married yet. I think they get, but his wife kills herself, and so they do get married eventually. Mm -hmm. Percy's not a good guy either. A lot of things I've read that, like, if you looked at their relationship today, it would probably be emotionally abusive. But he was a really big supporter of her writing. Mm -hmm. Remember, her parents were famous writers, and so it was probably really exciting for Shelley to be with a writer who was really good, right? So tell me about the competition, because this is right. the fun thing. This is the fun thing, and it sounds like it's not true, but this totally actually is. happened. <laughs> so they are stuck inside every day. It's raining. There's nothing to do. They're so bored. Cabin so, fever. Yeah. Them. Basically, they found in this big villa a book of ghost stories, and mm-hmm. so they start reading ghost stories to each other, and that's fun. And then <laughs> Lord Byron says, I have an idea. We are going to have a competition. Mm-hmm. Oh, I know I totally got off track. So it's Byron and Claire. And oh, then yeah. I went into that whole tangent. <laughs> Sorry. And then <laughs> there's Mary Godwin and her fiance, Percy Shelley. Percy And then there's a fifth person there. And that is Dr. Polidari, John Polidari. He is like 23 and he's Byron's doctor. Byron mistreats him too. <laughs> <laughs> he like always puts him down. And <laughs> Okay. You guys have heard of a Byronic hero, right? So a Byronic hero is... It's basically Lord Byron. Like, it's someone who is kind of, like, swashbuckling and, like, cynical and, like, super moody. And, like, think of, like, your typical, like, gothic rock star. Rock star. And that is a Byronic hero. It's literally named after Lord Byron because he is one. Larger than life. Yeah, absolutely. So there's these five people, young people, stuck. And so Byron says, let's have a competition. We're writers here. Everyone has to come up with a ghost story. Mm -hmm. You have like a week to write this. Right. So Dr. Polidari comes back and he had a story called The Vampire, Hmm. which is a precursor to Bram Stoker's Dracula. Right. Uh, And it's spelled like V-A-M-P-Y-R-E. Yeah, that's the traditional spelling of vampire. And, And Byron actually would go on to publish it under his own name. This guy. Yeah. <laughs> Anywho. Oh, well, Dr. Polidari would later kill himself because he couldn't get credit for the vampire. Oh, my goodness. He killed himself when he was 25. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. And he was, like, super in debt. So he has a sad end. A lot of things happen because of this right. story this, competition. Yeah. Byron wrote a story called Phantasmagoria, which has been forgotten. Like, no one gives a crap. Yep. Because. Because. <laughs> and uh, they don't even really say what Shelley and Claire wrote. No. Doesn't matter. It no. doesn't matter. <laughs> it's blown away. Because Mary's like, hey guys, I'm 18 and I just wrote Frankenstein. But this didn't come out of the blue. 
So her story, Frankenstein, is about a man named Dr. Frankenstein. He's not even doctor in the novel. He's nope. Victor Frankenstein. And he's a student of medicine. Yes. And he doesn't say how he does it. He says, I gathered the tools of life and I created out of body parts a creature. Yeah. So I'll go a little bit more into the plot, but he creates his creature and then he abandons the creature. Right. And the creature goes after him. That, that in a nutshell, Basic. plot yep. is it. Uh, he created life. Uh, then he's like, ugh. <laughs> Abandons him immediately. Right. And the creature is actually very sweet and learns to talk, and, and he's he's good. He's like a babe in the woods. He doesn't know anything, and yeah. he is really smart and very articulate. The stranger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, speaks better English than I do, which doesn't say much. <laughs> so she, she has this amazing story, and then after, you know, the trip, then she fleshes it out, and she publishes it in 1818. At first, people didn't believe that this could be written by an 18-year-old girl. And they thought, well, Percy definitely wrote this. (laughs) Because she couldn't get it published under her name because nobody believed that she wrote it. And they didn't think that a young woman should be saying such creepy things. Right. Newsflash. Yeah. It's fine. (laughs) So she finally got published, and once it became popular, uh, Shelley was able to get her name on it. Like, Mm -hmm. saying, like, I did not write it. This is her work. Right. Stand-up guy in one instance. Good for <laughs> <Yeah>. him. <laughs> so the story goes that like she sort of had this dream and then she woke up and she wrote Frankenstein, right? Mm-hmm. But there are all these influences that made up Frankenstein sure. leading up to this. So she maybe had some ideas and then this just solidified it. And one of those things was the science that was going on at the time. Because Mary had been listening to Poldari and Byron and Shelley talking about Galvanism. <laughs> What's galvanism, Roxanne? Galvanism <laughs> was uh, invented, discovered yeah. by a Dr. Galvini in Italy. <laughs> and essentially, he had figured out that if you use electrical impulses or... Yeah. An electrical stimulus. An electrical stimulus held to a dead muscle can make it contract. Right. So he first, and the most famous experiment that has been recreated many times, is that if you take some frog legs, you can electrify its legs and it will make them move. Yes. He even went so far, though, before medical ethics were in place, he would do demonstrations on corpses. No. And so he actually <laughs> did a demonstration on this corpse to like a whole like medical theater of people. Ah. And they were like throwing up and walking out. Dude, because medical theaters are... Can we just talk about this for a second? <laughs> yeah. like whole... So what's a medical theater? <laughs> so medical theater is like before the days of the internet mm-hmm. and widespread book publications, the way you would learn medicine or other scientific things... Maybe they still have them. I'm not sure. I, I mean, probably, but I don't think this is the way no. things are done anymore. But they used to do it a lot. Yes. There would be a literal theater right like a classroom with like amphitheater type seating Mm -hmm. where you would be up there and taking notes and someone would be like doing experiments or or medical procedures on the floor of this just in plain view of like 50 people Well, because it was the only way you could learn yeah i mean it's great because of course you have to learn these things if you're a doctor you Mm got to learn somehow and back in the day because the church was against dissecting humans medical students would steal dead bodies yes big huge black market trade yeah and bodies yeah uh these two men hair and burke mm-hmm. in scotland i believe like yes they were like the the kings of this cartel <laughs> the body snatching kings basically yeah. oh my gosh <laughs> look into hair and burke that's b-u-r-k-e it's fascinating yeah but medical students couldn't learn any other way yeah you should if you're really interested in this uh, read the book Stiff by Mary Roach. Ooh, is she, it fiction or nonfiction? It's a nonfiction, but she goes into like our weird history of like relationships with death, oh. and she talks about this a lot, and it's really interesting. Cool. So anyway, medical theater, super weird. <laughs> Can you tell I'm great. really into this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we are we are very um, weirdly excited about this. <laughs> so going back to Dr. Galvini, he yeah, so he was in this medical theater, and at one point he touched it to the corpse's head, and he started making, like, what? Con- like he could get him to make, like, facial expressions, like, oh. grimaces, and, like, smiles, and, like, it was horrifying. That's the it worst was thing you ever told me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. So from this, the term galvanism came from this doctor, Dr. Galvini. Thank you. 
<laughs> Great history lesson. So galvanism <laughs> is, is it, so would you say galvanism now is just the idea of like using animation. electrical impulses to... Yes, to create animation. Yeah. Yeah. It, so it's not necessarily like... No. Nope. I, I don't yep, know. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho. Yeah, this is where she gets this idea. But as we'll talk about what Frankenstein is about, mm-hmm. there are some major themes that come up. Huge. And one of them is abandonment. And so thinking about how Mary grew up, her mother died, her father kicked her out of the house, essentially, or, you know, he, he sent her away because she didn't get along with her stepmother. Also, Byron was abandoning Claire Claremont when she got pregnant. Shelley had abandoned his wife, and Mary Shelley felt a lot of guilt that Shelley had left his wife and child to be with her, mm-hmm. especially after Harriet committed suicide. Right. She felt like it was in part because of her actions right. that she destroyed another person. And not too long after all of this. So this is Frankenstein is published in 1818, mm-hmm. and in 1822, Percy Shelley drowns mm-hmm. in a He's boating only, accident. He's 29. Yeah. So she's a widow at the age of 24. And at this point, she has had several kids who didn't survive, but they do Mm -hmm. have one surviving child of their own. Percy Florence Shelley. And so at this point, I mean, they'd had a really weird lifestyle. Anyway, it's kind of, again, that bohemian thing where they Mm -hmm. were constantly, like, living off the generosity of friends and writing weird letters to have their friends, like, Mm -hmm. send them money. Eventually, Shelley gets really famous. Yeah. Mary Shelley also becomes super famous Though she wouldn't receive any royalties from any right. plays that they made of the day. Because mm-hmm. there weren't copyright laws yet. But she did become famous from the book. Right. And then she did keep writing after, like, before and after Percy Shelley's death to keep herself out of poverty, her and her kid. But they were shunned completely by Percy Shelley's dad, mm-hmm. who still owned the Shelley estate. So she wrote a ton of short stories. She wrote literary criticism. Um, she was really into, like, opera reviews. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, wrote tons and tons of cool. opera reviews. She wrote some books of, uh, some poetry books, some poems, and some travel books, actually. Because Percy and her traveled a ton. A lot. <laughs> they lived in Italy for four years. They traveled all over the continent. Yeah. Just to wrap up how what happened to the other members of that party yeah. in Switzerland. Byron dies young. He went to join a war, mm-hmm. like, for the excitement of it. Yep. Um, <laughs> very Byronic. <laughs> I do want to say that one of his kids, this is also an interesting fun fact. Um, one of his, Ada Lovelace? Yeah, one of his kids is Ada Lovelace. Who is Ada Lovelace? Uh, Ada Lovelace is, like, a computer programmer, but, like, one of the OG computer programmers, uh, like, before computers were computers, like, brain computers, basically. She's amazing. Yeah, she basically invented coding. Yeah. Um, Ada Lovelace. It's like how Hedy Lamarr, she was this beautiful actress, and in World War II, she helped work on a project that would then become cell phone technology. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, there's a really great documentary about her called Bombshell. Once again, we're off topic. But I know. So Ada Lovelace, daughter of Byron, who dies very young. Did I also mention that Fanny, a- another tragedy that affected Mary Shelley and she felt responsible for, is that her half-sister Fanny uh, also killed herself because Mary had like ruined her reputation by running away. Man, she okay. went through her life with just guilt and yeah, I get it. Feeling like my decisions kill people. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah. And it's really interesting cuz she is apparently the only person she knows who lives past the age of like 40. <laughs> Did you know and this is super goth. Like she is I, the OG goth favorite. lady. Okay, tell me. <laughs> well, one Byron would not let her go to Shelley's funeral. Oh, didn't know that. Is that messed up? That's very. Uh, but they're like, but hey, so we burned him on a pyre on the beach. This is my favorite. Uh, so you can have his heart. Thank you. Well, she kind of was like, <laughs> like tight. okay, yeah. She was like, cool. And then she like wrote down lines from one of his poems, like uh-huh. um, Adonais. It's about the death of John Keats, another poet who died young. <laughs> who died young. But it's very like, oh, weep for Adonais. He is dead. Wake, melancholy mother. Wake and weep. Yet wherefore, quench within their burning bed thy fiery tears, and let thy loud heart keep, like his, a mute and uncomplaining sleep. She never got remarried, but she took this heart, she <laughs> wrapped it in the poem, and then she like put it in one of those um, rolling desks, like a secretary, yep. they're called. Cool desks. 
<laughs> and then it was found by her son after her death, and he was like, mm-hmm. ew. <laughs> um, they opened her desk on the one-year anniversary of her death. <laughs> To find, yes, their father's heart. Okay. Um, wrapped in a copy of his poem. They're like, oh my god, mom. And um, also a notebook that she shared with Percy while Aww. they were both alive, which is very sweet. Like, yeah. just with their, you know, thoughts and notes and stuff to each other. Mm-hmm. Which is pretty pretty great. Hmm. But she dies, nobody really knows, but possibly of a brain tumor yeah. at the age of 54. Oh, yeah. ironic. Uh-huh. A little bit. Yes. Huh. So... Um, oh, and just one last note. Her father-in-law finally does kind of acknowledge her and her kids. So Percy Florence does actually get awarded the estate in 1926. Oh. And is a name. 1826? Sorry, yes. 1826. And becomes Lord Shelley. Oh. Wow. So eventually, something happy happens to him. Do you know if Byron ever actually got married? Or did he also? He did. Ada Lovelace is his only kid. Legitimate. Legitimate kid. Yeah. Okay. So that's Mary Shelley. That's life. a lot about Mary Shelley. We're very into her, clearly. <laughs> Especially we talked like about it for a half an hour. And she's, you know, she's great. She's so interesting. She's yeah. my she's my hero now. Right. Well, and I think the whole like mythos behind the birth of this Frankenstein thing also just plays into the actual Frankenstein thing, which mm-hmm. I think is great. So, the book Frankenstein, subtitled or the Modern Prometheus, uh, published in eighteen eighteen. We've already talked a little bit about the plot, but basically a brilliant young scientist, Victor Frankenstein, decides that he has unlocked the the power to give life to dead objects and creates, by body snatching, the choicest parts of other human beings (laughs) and then stitching them all up together, creates a new being, Mm -hmm. which is super fascinating because science is obviously progressing, but it hasn't progressed like a ton. And Mary Shelley is an 18-year-old woman Uh, writing this, like, weird ghost story. So Frankenstein's creature, we're also going to talk about that. Frankenstein's creature is, like, eight feet tall Mm -hmm. and, like, bulky, right? But think about this scientifically. Like, now, you and I, like, if you and I just took each other's arms and swapped them and, like, Mm -hmm. took our coworkers' legs and swapped them, like, we'd be I mean, everyone gets us confused for each other anyway. That's true. Uh, I'm just saying we'd be, like, the same size we are now, Mm -hmm. right? Stealing other parts of other people's bodies wouldn't make us eight feet tall. So it's just kind of an interesting, like, scientific overlook that she thinks that by, like, combining all of these body parts yeah. from different people, that, like, that would somehow make him... Like, do you think he had really long legs or a really long torso? <laughs> like, really think about I this. I mean, cause... I hope that they stole, like, a horse's legs. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's kind of an interesting, because it's the birth of sci-fi, but the actual fact of his creation is mm-hmm. not super scientific. Yeah. And he's supposed to have... Really white teeth, Mm -hmm. which I think is funny. Which, England, no. No. (laughs) And then he's supposed to have yellow skin. Yeah, it's like jaundiced. Yeah, jaundiced skin, and then he has flowing black hair. Yes, because of course. I mean, actually, your hair actually grows after you die. Does it grow? Quite possibly. It just pushes. Or is your skin retracting? I think that's a chicken or an egg question. But your hair gets longer. I, yeah, but I think it, the reason is I think your skin retracts a little bit. Okay, gross. Thank you for that. <laughs> so anyway, kind of interesting. The creature ends up being like eight foot tall. And Frankenstein is immediately like reviled. He wants nothing to do with this creature. Mm-hmm. And he's doing this in secret. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So like a friend comes to visit and he's like, oh my God. <laughs> right. Don't look back. It's yeah, like basically it's like he's slapstick movies. He's, we're both... <laughs> Have, we both have our hands up. He basically is like in front of him. He's like, there's nothing to see here. Exactly. Oh my God. <laughs> right. So totally in secret because he's kind of like thrown out of the university for his ideas about like mm-hmm. being able to create people. So he throws the creature out on his own. He goes back to yeah, his... He immediately makes him and then immediately is like, I've made a huge mistake. Yes. It and abandons him. Of giraffes though, like... You plop out a baby giraffe, and then it, you expect it to walk around on its own and be mostly pretty fine without really intervention. Yeah. It's crazy. Oh. Huh. Anyway, I, like, obviously they take care of the baby giraffes. I'm just saying, like, for the most part, like, you're dropping a baby giraffe, like, 10 mm-hmm. feet to the ground, and yeah. then just letting it walk on its oh. own. Wow. Yeah. It's pretty weird discovery, too. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I watched way too much of that as a kid. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, immediately abandons this creature. Because he's horrified. It's like, what did you think was going to happen, right. dude? <laughs> Didn't you see it before you galvanized it into reanimation? And and look, this is hitting 
it's like hitting the head with how obvious it is. It's like, who is the real monster here? Right. It's Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> Spoiler alert. He, he is, is the monster. He is the monster. He created life and then abandoned it. Right. Because the creature, and I'm, so I will do my, my I'm going to do my hardest not to call the creature Frankenstein. Because I he's know, not it's Frankenstein. Fr- I know. It is Frankenstein's okay. monster. Or Frankenstein's creature. Because I don't actually think that he's a monster. I know. That's great. Right. So, because yep. who is the real monster? Exactly. It's Dr. Frankenstein. So he's mm-hmm. abandoned the creature, right? Um, he goes back to his family and basically like withdraws from society. He's like, I am so depressed about the mess I've made of my life. And, and there's, a, there's a creature wandering out there somewhere. Yeah, just like out and about that he's not doing anything about. <laughs> and he's just hoping <laughs> it'll like go away if he doesn't think about it. Right. He's back. One of his younger brothers is murdered and like a little boy yeah a a small tiny child so his brother dies their friend slash maid is hanged Mm -hmm. because she confesses to this murder that Mm -hmm. she does not do and frankenstein's sister slash cousin slash orphan that they took in and now he's in love with he calls her my more than sister which just blows (laughs) (laughs) me anyway he calls her my more than sister and they're supposed to be like together it was like a so they, they took in this orphan girl, and then the whole family is like, okay, we're hoping that you guys don't get, like, the natural vibes that you're supposed to get, which is right. to not to feel attracted not. to family members. Mm-hmm. But if you do, that'd be, like, super cool and you should get married. <laughs> Low-key, we want that to happen. Yeah. They're like, so get it. Like, if you do, like, feel, like, gross that's a family member. Just ignore that instinct. But it's if you're fine. into it, like, you should get married. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and guess what? They're into it. Oh, yeah. Super into it. He decides that to get Elizabeth, his more than sister, out of her funk after their brother dies, well, they're going to get married. It'll like lift his father's spirits. It'll lift Elizabeth's spirits. He's like, I don't deserve That's this. That's a good reason to get married. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but first, Frankenstein knows that his creation murdered his brother and mm-hmm. basically set Justine off on this course. So he sets out to find Frankenstein's creature they talk. The creature's like, listen, everybody hates me, and I just want to, like, go to South America and be by myself, but I want a woman to come with me. So mm-hmm. I need you to create a woman, please. The creature taught himself to talk over, like, a series of chapters where he basically lived in the woods by himself, and he would spy on this family family in the woods in a cottage that he got really attached to mm-hmm. watching them, and he felt real affection for them. And he's like, okay, every time I see somebody, they scream and run away. But the father is blind. So if I can talk to the father alone and get him to see that I'm a very good person. Yeah. Also, he like reads everything. He read Paradise Lost. Yeah. The creature. (laughs) Yeah. He's very uh, well spoken, well read, well rounded. He's a gentleman. Human being. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Uh, And he's like, okay, I just, if I can get this blind old man to talk to me without knowing what I look like, then he can keep his children from freaking, his grown children from freaking out. Then I can like maybe join their family and it'll (laughs) be great. And because all he wants is a friend. He just wants love. He wants love. It's it's, <laughs> it's, it's not a scary book. It's sad. Yeah. Well, it's a little scary. Well, a little scary. But, but mostly sad. It's mostly sad. Yeah. And while he's trying to, like, make this happen, he finally is talking to the blind man. The son comes home, and he's like, oh, my God, there's a monster in here. <laughs> and so he gets chased out, and then Frankenstein's monster is like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to burn your cottage down. <laughs> yeah. Does he do it on purpose or is it an accident? Oh, he does it on purpose. Yeah, he's like, basically, it's like my he love doesn't has think turned they're to hate. in there, to be fair, but they're totally in the Why cottage. did he burn it down? Rejection. So oh, they were going to move. They're like, we have to move because the yeah. creature's going to oh, come yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. So he is burns mad it. and he burns the thing and they're all in there. That's not great. So he, murder Baby's num- first murders. That was, yeah, baby's first murders. Yeah. And then he murders <laughs> the, Jeez, the his, brother. His brother. And now he's tracked down his creator, Frankenstein. And he's like, you need to make me a mate, and then I will leave you alone. Just make me a mate who's as scary as I am, and then (laughs) I'll have someone. And then she won't be afraid of me because she'll be horrible too. Must have 5,000 stitches, (laughs) green skin, and a good sense of humor. Must love reanimated dogs. (laughs) Or invisible cats. Yeah. So anyway. Frankenstein refuses to make... He actually does make it, but then refuses to animate. That's the worst part. Is he's like, okay, I'll do it. He's under arrest because uh, the monster is like, I will kill everyone unless you do this. Mm-hmm. And so he's like, fine. So he creates the female creature 
And then in front of Frankenstein, he's like, I'm not going to do this. And he destroys her. Yep. Tears her apart. Guess what happens Gross. then? Then the creature goes, fine, whatever, I guess. I'll see you on your wedding night. So Frankenstein is terrified. It's like, not my wedding night to my more than sister. Right? No. Oh my gosh. So anyway, Frankenstein does decide to get married to Elizabeth. Because he's like, he's going to kill me. Right, like, he's going to kill me. Whatever. I will always be chased by the creature, so yeah. I'm just going to get married. Might as well be happy for a little bit before something bad happens to me. Guess what happens? Uh, bad things. Bad things happen. So they get married, and basically, instead of killing Frankenstein, the creature decides to make him miserable for the rest of his life. So Frankenstein is told as an epistolary novel. This is actually told as a series of letters and diary entries Mm. from this guy who's out cruising around in Arctic waters and happens to pick Frankenstein up. This is the only thing I do not like about the novel. Yeah, it's not great. It's a very 1800s thing where it's like they don't get to the story for like 50 pages. So if you decide to read Frankenstein, and I really recommend that you do, Mm -hmm. just get through the first 50 pages. Or just skip the first... I mean, honestly... Actually, I think the revised edition... In 1831 that she, mm-hmm. that came out, actually starts as it's like, less. it was a November night when nice. I yeah. actually started. So Just this, get through the first 50 pages. It's super boring. Yeah. It's one of those things where this guy meets Frankenstein. He's like, oh, you're my best friend now. Tell me about your life. And Frankenstein like starts telling him about his life. So this guy's like writing letters to his sister in England to be like, hey, mm-hmm. this like crazy thing happened to me. You'll never believe it. But I've got proof because I wrote it down in a diary, which I think is funny. And it's weird because it ends up being like a third hand account of what happens at mm-hmm. one point because... Walton, the guy who finds Frankenstein, writes down in his diary that Frankenstein tells him that Frankenstein's creature read some letters that the old man's son had. And yeah, he's like, and I can show you if you need proof. Yeah, it's funny because he's like, I I have the proof. I don't have it right now, but just believe me that it's out there. There is proof. Don't worry about it. Yeah, but it's kind of one of those things. We talked about this when we talked about the color purple, Mm -hmm. where it was presented as a collection of, of found objects that would have been of public interest. So somebody... Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, Mm -hmm. found them and then published them for people's interest, Mm -hmm. which is kind of a weird idea. And I don't really love the structure of the novel. No, it's very 1800s. Mm -hmm. It's very gothic romanticism. Yeah. Dracula is very similar. Oh, extremely similar. Dracula is also epistolary, and it also is a lot of lead up Mm -hmm. into getting to the story. Yeah. We had to read that in high school. Yikes. Uh, Another book that does this is Heart of Darkness. Mm -hmm. This is super common. It is an early example of modern sci-fi. Well, she is called the mother of science fiction. Yeah. In fact, she's credited with creating the entire genre, which is amazing. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And she's coming out of like the romantic movement. Mm -hmm. So Shelley and Byron are considered romantic poets. Mm -hmm. And uh, romanticism is kind of like teaching that peaceful relationship between like man and nature and talks about death as like a process of restoration Mm -hmm. and mary shelley just slaps that in the face and says no this is this is not how things work (laughs) it's also um an early example of doubling which is a literary device where i've never heard of that yeah where two people there's two people in the story who are like foils for each other right like their storylines parallel each other or something about their characters parallel each other to kind of explore the double nature of an idea oh that's cool Mm -hmm. so what would be another example of that uh so the most famous one is probably the strange case of dr jekyll and mr hyde okay that immediately came into my mind but i wasn't sure because it's the same character technically but exactly right it's two sides to the same person yeah and it ha- it's obviously it's all over in literature. It happens a lot. I think you could even make the case that Heart of Darkness is kind of like that. Would it also be like in Les Mis, uh, Javert, and Valjean? I think you could probably consider that because an act uh, of doubling. Yeah, because it's it's like the upright law, but the actual noble thief. Right, and they yeah, and that's they're a good ch- he's chasing him and. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, that's interesting. I have, I've never heard that concept right? before. Good example of that. And also, obviously, we've talked about gothic literature a lot. What without, makes something gothic? I was going to say, without telling you about it. Okay. So gothic literature is kind of like a subgenre almost, where there's a lot of extreme emotion. There's some really exalted speech. If you read this, you'll be like, oh my god, someone like really wanted to cram in a bunch of words. Yeah, definitely um, not how people speak naturally. No. Uh, it has a lot to do with the plight of, like, chaste young women. 
So thinking mm-hmm. about Elizabeth, mm-hmm. that's in there a lot. Abuses levied on people by charismatic villains. Mm-hmm. So Frankenstein and or Frankenstein's creature, depending on how you fall on that one. Mm-hmm. And kind of put up against like some picturesque ruins. Like he's in that cabin on the lake that's pretty... Uh, he travels a lot. He, he goes travels to Scotland, he goes to England, he goes to Germany. He's all of these like cool lakes. Anyway, yeah. yeah. So like some really picturesque scenery behind it. And then the fact of like sins of the past weighing really heavily on the plot. Mm. So good example of gothics. And then the last thing I want to mention with the book, I told you it was subtitled, or the modern Prometheus. Mm -hmm. So Prometheus is a Greek myth. He was punished by the gods for bringing fire to humans. So what his punishment was that he got his liver pecked out? Yeah, every day. He's like, (laughs) like, he's he's tied to like a rock. Yeah, he's like 10 a.m. 10 a.m., eagle soars in, eats liver, flies away. Right. 12 p.m., regrow liver, Mm -hmm. wait for eagle to return. Mm -hmm. 10 a.m. next day, eagle swoops in, eats liver. Every day. Thanks for eternity. For the fire, Prometheus. <laughs> so why Solid is he man, called thank you. Prometheus? The modern Prometheus. So I think that that title is super interesting because it refers to not Frankenstein's creature, but Frankenstein himself, mm. who basically steals the secret of giving life and is punished through the actions of his own creature. So his creature like constantly takes things away from his own life, mm. which is kind of like, you know, Prometheus's liver being mm. devoured by birds every day. Interesting. Yeah. I love our spooky talks. I do too. <laughs> They're fun. Okay, so let's move on. Obviously, I mean, there are... I'm like not in excitement. Thousands of adaptations of More, There are ballets. There are plays. They, they had plays of the story as early as 1923. Wow. There's a fun quote that Mary Shelley went to one of these plays, which by the way, like I said, she didn't make any money from because there's right. no copyright. Lame. I don't think it occurred to her to make money from it. Probably not. But she said after the play, she was like, my goodness, I woke up and I'm famous. That's so great. <laughs> yeah. So she was delighted <laughs> yeah. with, with all of this. Yeah. It's still going on. But I, I particularly would like to talk about, and I think you would too, the 1931 Universal Frankenstein. Yeah, that's the standard for when we think of the monster. Right. And right before going there, there was one movie before that mm-hmm. in 1910. Whoa. Thomas Edison made a Frankenstein movie. I'm sorry, repeat that for me. Did you know this? No. Oh, I could tell if you're like acting surprised. No, I'm like for real. Flabbers. Yeah, it's. You should Google it right now. <laughs> Thomas Edison made his own. Because you know he made movies. No? Oh, Thomas Edison, yeah, had his own production company. He actually tried to, he's a bad guy. He tried to, like, create a whole monopoly on, like, he tried to own, like, anyone who used one of his cameras, like, that now content belonged to him, is what he tried to do. Wow. Yeah. This is fascinating. He tried to run all these people out of business. Okay. Oh, it's interesting. But anyway, he made a Frankenstein in 1910, you can find it on YouTube, and he looks like a big uh, furball. Hmm. He kind of looks like a Chewbacca. Great type character. He looks really funny, actually. (laughs) Like, it's like a man like a monkey suit almost. Okay. Yeah. So that was the the first time he was on film. But yeah, they were doing all sorts of adaptations up until then. Sure. So 1931, the same year that Dracula came out, they come out with with Frankenstein. It's directed by James Whale. (laughs) If you want to hear more about James Whale, go back and listen to our Invincible Man episode Mm -hmm. because we go pretty in depth about his life. Yeah. But James Well is the godfather of horror in the United States. Right. Famous movies before this that influenced him were The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, Nosferatu, and Metropolis. Okay, so those those are sense. Those are the three big horror movies that came out before this. Right. The monster is played by Boris Karloff, Mm -hmm. who, by all accounts, is the sweetest man. <laughs> and you think, you hear Boris Karloff, you're like, okay, so he, oh, he's like Bela Lugosi. So Bela Lugosi played Dracula mm-hmm. and he was offered the role of Frankenstein, but Bela Lugosi was like, I'm sorry, the monster doesn't talk? <laughs> okay, uh, I'm Dracula. I'm sexy right. as heck. Uh, <laughs> and I'm sorry, like, I'm not going to play a creature that's not sexy. Right. Because I'm Bela Lugosi. I'm sexy Bela Lugosi. Wow. Jokes on him, 12 <laughs> years later, he would end up playing Frankenstein after Boris Karloff was like, I'm not doing this anymore. Hilarious. So they get Boris Karloff. His real name was William Pratt. You might be familiar 
people in the UK will call someone a prat, mm-hmm. kind of like a stupid head. A dumb dumb. <laughs> yeah, basically. He was, and so as <laughs> early as 1910, when he's a stage actor, he changed his name from William Pratt to Boris Karloff. And Karloff was a family name on his mother's side. Interesting. It is his first... He was in, like, dozens of movies mm-hmm. leading up to this point, but it's yep. his first, like, big breakout role. This made him an international star. Yeah. And he doesn't have any lines. He just grunts a lot. Yeah. And he was in his 40s mm-hmm. when he filmed, which is pretty crazy for, like, a breakout role to be in your 40s. He was discovered at the Universal Studios cafeteria. The funny story is that James Whale, the director, saw him in the cafeteria and... Boris Carlos said he like was feeling was really feeling himself that day. He was like, I looked really good. Uh, like I had my movie makeup on, but it was like the good makeup and I was wearing my best suit. And then he came over and he was like, You'd make a great monster. And he was like, Thanks, yeah, I would totally yeah. talk to me about this movie. Yeah. So if you hear him talk, he he has this like very he's very soft spoken. Mm-hmm. He's very genteel and Yeah. It's pretty funny. I love Boris Karloff. Yeah. And he was just apparently the sweetest man. Yeah. The thing that I think is interesting about that movie is like you said, it's the second movie adaptation, but probably like the first really like famous movie adaptation that was going to be seen by like a wide audience. Mm-hmm. And it, I mean, everything about Frankenstein and Frankenstein's creature has totally changed. Mm-hmm. So in the book where he is this really genteel sort of, he can uh, speak and he, he yeah he can speak he has very a articulately intense inner life yeah um, he is a straight up monster in the movie can't speak doesn't understand what's going on. The scene that I love is, I mean, after the it's alive, it's alive scene, which is great and iconic. Um, Dr. Frankenstein is played by Colin Clive, yeah. who has a sad story. Yep. He was an alcoholic. <laughs> surprise, surprise. We yeah. love sad stories here. He was an alcoholic and drank himself to death. Yep. Anyway, and his wife on. didn't go to his funeral. I didn't know that. Yeah. Ooh, Ooh see, we're getting some parallels here. Ooh. Anywho. All right. And I don't. I actually think James Whale didn't go either even though they were very good friends in real life. Really? Anywho. Oh, my favorite scene right after that, it's alive, it's alive. I know, I think I know which one you're talking about. Do you? When they open up the skylight. Yes, yeah. it's so good. So basically Frankenstein has just been animated and he, he basically is like a big baby. Mm-hmm. He doesn't know anything. Yeah. And Not his fault. He's totally disoriented. <laughs> it's like when somebody wakes me up from a nap with a phone call and I'm like, uh. <laughs> and they yeah. open up a skylight and... And the sun shines into his face, and mm-hmm. he's like, it makes just, you want to cry. It's so good. He, he's this, just enjoying this, and he's like phenomenon. reaching towards the sun. Oh, and you you want you want good things for him. Yeah, because he's not bad. No, he he's, just doesn't know yeah. what he's doing. And then immediately, Doctor Frankenstein's lab assistant, who's not Igor, his name is Fritz, right? But also does not exist in the book. Does it's not a exist new invention. In the book. Starts tormenting him, like whipping him. He's being a real. Mm. <laughs> it's like whipping him and like has a torch and is like putting it in his face. And yeah, this is where terrified. the he's afraid of fire thing comes from. Yeah, um, is this because he doesn't understand what fire or light is in this? Because nobody has taken the time to explain to him how life works. Yeah, they they bring him to life and then they essentially were like, "It's a monster, kill it." Yeah, I mean, he ends up murdering the assistant. Yeah, and Fritz. whose fault is that, Fritz? <laughs> I mean, I don't want to say it's you, but it's definitely you. Look at you, Fritz. Saying, like, if you poke a dog, you're going to get bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then escapes and wreaks havoc on the town. And there's another, I mean, just fantastic. Boris Karloff is, you guys, he's so, so good. And he is underneath pounds of makeup. Yeah. It took him three hours to get into makeup every day. Mm-hmm. And he has a back brace. He has a back brace. He's wearing lifted shoes mm-hmm. that weighed 13 pounds each <laughs> um Yikes. and he also had dental work in back like dental plates oh. and he took them out to give him a sunken look to his cheeks oh is that amazing that's pretty fascinating and i also want to say i got a lot of information just from reading various books but um there's a fantastic movie podcast called unspooled and they did a direct, uh, Frankenstein episode, so I want to give them credit for some of these fun facts. Like this one where the makeup process or like the look of Frankenstein mm-hmm. is still under license by Universal Studios. Oh. And it won't run out until 2026. So 2026, looking at you, some yeah. great Frankenstein stuff coming out then. I know. It'll be like the great Gatsby coming out th- this year. Being in the public domain now. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. So Thanks. anyway. Yeah, <laughs> Boris Karloff in this 
fantastic makeup and these lifts and this whole big suit that he's wearing is crazy. He meets this little girl next to this pond and she's like trying to play with him. Mm -hmm. And And she's not scared of him. No. Um, Because, you know, the innocence of little, little kids. And not quite understanding what he's doing, he accidentally drowns her. But there is this fantastic scene that I honestly don't know if this would get put into anything today. They're all like getting ready for the wedding between... Um, Frankenstein and Mm -hmm. Elizabeth. And by the way, he's Henry Frankenstein in this, not Victor. And he is a friend to Henry in the book. In the book, so I don't know why they, like, did that. Victor Frankenstein's such a better name. It is. It's way cooler. They're all, like, getting ready to celebrate. Everyone is so happy. And this dad is walking through the celebration with his dead daughter in his arms. Mm -hmm. And she's, like, so tiny, right? She's maybe, like, six. Mm -hmm. And uh, just walks through the entire village, this whole tracking shot where he, like, is going past all these people reveling and drinking and have like making mm-hmm. merry with this dead girl in his arms. And it's like, I'm not joking. I watched it like three times because I was like, wh- mm-hmm. what is even happening to my life right now? Now, I'm curious crazy. Which, which version you saw because what you're talking about was a huge fight with the censors. Oh, I bet. This actually is a pre-code film. I won't get too much right. into it. But in 1934, they set up these rules that basically made movies like general audience. Right. So it's a whole long story. But before that, movies were a lot darker, a lot sexier, because they weren't having to adhere to these rules yet. Right. But even, like, the idea of a little girl dying, like, this was a huge deal to everyone. Even Boris Karloff was like, I don't want to do this. Oh. But I'm curious about the version you saw. So the reason he throws a little girl in the pond is because... She's playing with him, oh, and with they're the throwing flowers. flowers in the pond, mm-hmm. and he in, in, they run out of flowers, and he innocently throws her in the pond. Yeah. It, she drowned, right? Right. But before they had the censored version, they're like, we're not going to show a little girl being drowned. Mm-hmm. So it would just cut from him lifting her up to the dad carrying her through town, oh. which is worse, because then you think that he did something really perverse. So the, the one that I saw... He, do, he picks her up, he throws her in, you see her, like, the mm-hmm. splash of her So hitting. that's the one that, yeah, I saw too. Yeah. So before, the one that 1931 audiences were saying is that oh. he picks her up, and so you think that he's just done something... Monstrous. Monstrous. Oh. And that completely changes it. Yeah, it does. It's like, now he's a, a pedophile, and... Oh. Oh my. Instead of being like, oh, he's innocent, he didn't realize he was hurting her. Oh, see, I like that version so much better. The innocent one. The innocent one. one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, okay. So yeah, so continue with the synopsis. They are chasing Boris Karloff in his monster thing. He ends up in a windmill. This is where he has back problems for literally the rest of his life. This is what you were talking about. Boris Karloff does? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, he had like three or four back surgeries after this because they go up into this mill and he is carrying Frankenstein, but he's carrying a man and he's actually doing it, right? There's no like Mm -hmm. lifts or anything. He is physically, and he's actually not... We think of him as, like, this big guy because he's not, I think he's not that big of a guy. Um, he's very skinny. Yeah, and it's actually maybe, it's said, one of the only films where the person playing Frankenstein is the same height as the monster. Oh. Anywho, he is carrying Colin Clive up these stairs in this rickety old windmill in his lifts and his back brace and mm. all of his pounds and pounds of makeup and costume, and he literally had back problems for the rest of his life. And do you know the reason why... They didn't use a dummy? No. It's so petty. What? Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. (laughs) Hit me. So James Whale, the director, pretty petty, Mm -hmm. and he was getting jealous of Karloff for all the attention he was getting Mm -hmm. for being the monster. And so he would do things like, I need you to carry Colin up the windmill. And, And everyone was like, dude, use a dummy. Even Colin Clive was like, we don't need to do this. <laughs> and James oh, Whale was no. like, no, we need to do this. Wow. Please just being petty. Wow. That's pretty crazy. I know. They would fight a lot, Karloff and Whale. Whale. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So, yeah, I don't want to talk a ton more about it, except to say that it's great. It's very different from the book. There's no score. That's weird. Oh, it is very weird. Yeah. It's, it's a really just quiet movie. Silence. Yeah. yeah. But not like a silent film. Like, it's, nope. it's right in between there. Yeah. Which is kind of weird. There yeah. are sounds. There's sound effects. Mm-hmm. But Great no sound music. effects. Yeah. But no music. That's interesting. That is interesting. So this one was followed up by The Bride of Frankenstein. Which could be argued is the better movie. Uh, yeah. I actually, I agree with that. Although The Bride of Frankenstein is literally only in it for maybe two minutes. Yeah, but it's so a it's good two a minutes. a misnomer, but it's a great two minutes. And uh, Bride of Frankenstein is 
uh, they have Mary Shelley in the very beginning kind of introducing the movie, mm-hmm. and it's the same actress, which I love. Right. It also is a little bit more like the book in that he mm-hmm. he is like in the woods and he meets a blind guy who mm-hmm. befriends him and some of the other things from the book are there more, mm-hmm. um, but it still flies right in the face of the book. It's it's very opposite. Mm-hmm. Mary Shelley was talking about how like she was trying to write like a moral tale and everybody just took it to be like this monster story. They're like cool a monster story, like, cool, man. Um, and that's not what it is. So the Bride of Frankenstein, arguably better. Really fantastic. But both really good. Yeah. Boris Karloff gets to talk a little bit more in it, so. Which but Boris Karloff literally called, quote unquote, stupid. Oh, he? was he? like, <laughs> having the monster talk <laughs> is stupid. That's funny. Yeah, yeah he hated it. And then Son of Frankenstein, a couple years later, Ghost of Frankenstein and House of Frankenstein. And House of Frankenstein, which I haven't watched yet, is like a powerhouse. It has not really? only Boris Karloff, but also Basil Rathbone. Of Sherlock Holmes fame. Oh, okay. Bella Lugosi and Lon Chaney. Wow. Like who was the Wolfman? Yeah, like crazy cast in that one. So I'm gonna, I need to go back and watch that one. Mm. I'm really curious about it. Of course, there's all sorts of, just all sorts of things since then. But one thing that you should watch that's kind of interesting is called In Search of the Real Frankenstein. Oh, I watched that. Did you? Okay. It's kind of cheesy. It, yeah. It's from 2000. It's like 2006. Yeah. Documentary cheesy. But I mean, it's a documentary about how the yeah. scientist, Galani, mm-hmm. and some of the other scientists inspired Frankenstein, inspired Mary Shelley. Yeah. We have it here at the library. In Search of Frankenstein. Come get it. Um, I'll return it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Hammer Horror series did The Curse of Frankenstein and Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed with Peter Cushing. Curse of Frankenstein also had Christopher Lee in it, mm. which is kind of cool. Or if I'm being the monster, ah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's Young Frankenstein in 1974. Which, which is, we should pause to... We'll, we'll talk about it real quick. Talk about. So 1974. Yeah. that's. I think Young Frankenstein is probably as famous as the 1931 if not more so. If now, not more so. I think, yeah. I think maybe more people have actually seen Young now, Frankenstein. Yeah, probably. Yeah. It's more common that you'd actually see that than the old 1931 movie. Mm-hmm. Um, it actually draws, it's by Mel Brooks. It was written by Gene Wilder, so the man from Willy Wonka. Wonka. Yeah. And he plays Young Frankenstein, so I didn't realize that he played it. Yeah. And, it, <laughs> and he's great. There's some scenes where you're like, oh, that's totally made up, but it's actually pulled pretty closely. For instance, the Igor character mm-hmm. goes to steal a brain from a <laughs> college class. And so you're like, oh, that must be right. you know, made up for the Super movie. From a from an operating theater, in fact, in you're a college right. class. Yeah. Uh, but no, in the original 1931 movie, mm-hmm. uh, he goes and steals a brain from an operating yeah. theater. An Abby Normal brain. Yeah. <laughs> it's the brain of Abby Normal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is so funny. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I can't recommend Young Frankenstein enough. And yeah. then they made a musical of Young Frankenstein. Which I've seen and it's pretty dope. Yeah. I would I would say like, I think it might be one of the funniest musicals I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Funny show. Go see it. Yes. Cloris Leachman is also in it. Yes. Which is fantastic. Yeah. And uh, they, they pull a lot of the elements from actually the Bride of Frankenstein. A lot of it's from Bride of Like the Cloris yeah. Leachman character, yep. who's hilarious, uh, who also plays the same, the actress in the movie of the Bride of Frankenstein, who plays this sort of like housekeeper character, mm-hmm. is the same woman from The Invisible Man, mm. Una O'Connor. Oh, yeah. So she also just like plays it's everything. Over She's the at a thousand all the time. Yeah. <laughs> True. And then there's also Gene Hackman cameo. Yes. Yeah. And you wouldn't. You wouldn't, you wouldn't actually know. know. He wanted to just, he's like, can you put me in the movie somewhere? And they're like, <laughs> sure, we'll make you the blind man in the woods. Yeah. And that's a very funny scene mm-hmm. where he like, he's like, do you want some soup, my friend? And he pours it in his lap. Yeah. And he's like, this is a cigar. Then he can't see. So he lights his like thumb on fire. Yep. So there's also, we mentioned, I think in The Invisible Man, that Abbott can, and Costello have a whole Meet the Monsters series. They do have a Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. It's from 1948. In 2014, uh, Aaron Eckhart and Bill Nye and Yvonne Strahovski, who you know that I oh, like. I love, who, no, I don't. Bill Nye. Oh, I love Bill Nye. Yeah. But who's Yvonne? We've talked about her before in The Handmaid's Tale. She okay. is Serena Joy. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, in 2014, they made a movie called I, Frankenstein. I super do not recommend it. Don't watch it. I took it out and then couldn't yeah. get myself to put it in the VCR. Right. Or the DVD. I sound so old. <laughs> in the VCR. <laughs> Can oh someone help me program my VCR? Be kind. Rewind. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Followed very shortly by Victor Frankenstein in 2015. Okay. Did you I watched... make it through that? Yeah, I did. Okay. I liked it. But has... I'll tell you why I 
stayed with it. Okay. Because I have a huge crush on the guy who's in it, um, Andrew Scott. Oh, I thought you were going to say Daniel Radcliffe. No. Okay. I have a huge crush on Andrew Scott, who plays, like, the policeman Mm -hmm. in it, uh, because he plays Hot Priest in Fleabag, which is my favorite show. Oh. So I I stuck with it for that. And I like James McAvoy. But it's it's Frankenstein told from the point of view of Igor. Gotcha. I want to read a few of the bullet points I made while watching Victor Frankenstein. (laughs) So, turns out he's not a hunchback. He just has an abscess on his back, and so Dr. Frankenstein does, like, a Dr. Pimple Popper on him, Ew. and I almost vomited. Ugh. It was, ugh. Gross. Also, at one point, I don't know if it's meant to be funny, but Daniel Radcliffe says, I'm a physician clown, because he starts out as a hunchback in the circus. Oh. Okay. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so that's interesting. Yeah. Um, my favorite adaptation is the Kenneth Branagh Frankenstein. So is Robert De Niro Frankenstein in that? Yes. I have not seen this one. Oh, it's fantastic. And when we talked about Shakespeare, uh, I told you that I call Kenneth Branagh Smokey Branagh. <laughs> this is the movie why I call him Smokey Branagh. Why do you call him Smokey Branagh? Um, because he spends about 90% of this movie with his shirt off and unnecessarily like drenched in sweat or rainwater or, you know, just... It's it's a very uh, a very sultry, smoky sort of look for okay. him. Okay. Okay. But it, he directed it as well, so he was literally like Kenneth. I think you should take your shirt off. <laughs> Kenneth, I think that's a great idea. I will unnecessarily run around without clothes today. Um, that's it's like you're not it. you're not playing the Invisible Man. <laughs> am I right? Am I right? Am I right? That's exactly how I imagine that conversation going. Um, but it's a really good movie. I, I really enjoy it, but that is where the essence of Smokey Brana comes from. All right. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. Oh, we should mention, I, I promised our coworker Nathan, who's been a guest on the show, <laughs> that we would mention Frankenberry cereal. Frankenberries? Oh, the cereal. Cereal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. That, that is a thing. It is a There's thing. There's Count Chocula and Frankenberries. And they pretty much only come out at Halloween. Count, Count Chocula, Chocula is not year-round. Mm-mm. I think you can find them like right around September, October. So run out right now and get Just buy stop. up your year's supply yeah. of Count Chocula and Frankenberries. And Frankenberries. It um, should be Frankenberries Monster cereal. <laughs> exactly right. Thank you. We'll we'll write and tell them. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are so many adaptations. Yeah, we could liter- we would literally be here all night telling you about everything that's out. We're already making this a longer episode. Yeah, just for you guys because we love you. You're welcome. Because I got really into it. Yeah, that too. <laughs> Basically, I spent the month of August just watching like Frankenstein-related content. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would say uh, the only other one that I would like to mention is Penny Dreadful, which is a show. I started it, but yeah. I didn't like the supernatural aspects. Oh. That ruined it for me. I'm okay with it. I, I mostly like the feeling of that show. Like, the atmosphere of it, I think, is really good. Basically, it's set in Victorian London. It's kind of all of the monsters put together. hmm Which I know it's like, well, Roxanne... It's Roxanne-y. a monster mash. It basically is a monster mash. Yeah. Um, and it's got Eva Green and Josh Hartnett in it. And I actually really enjoy it. At least, I guess, I will say I really enjoy, like, the first season or two. And then it gets kind of crazy. But it's fun. It's enjoyable. It's got Frankenstein, and uh, Josh Hartnett plays a werewolf slash cowboy, which is kind of great. Josh Hartnett's from Minnesota. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. So that's, I think, all I'll mention. Oh, uh, I will mention that I listened to it, and it was narrated by, oh, I can't think of his name at the moment, but he plays Matthew from Downton Abbey. <laughs> oh, yeah. What is that guy's and, name? Oh, Dan something. Yeah. He was a narrator, and it was... Fine. (laughs) (laughs) Rousing endorsement. There was apparently a movie this year called The Last Frankenstein. It's a 2021 American horror film Mm. about Jason Frankenstein's mission to carry on his family's gruesome scientific work. I take umbrage with the name Jason Frankenstein. (laughs) I don't even want to watch it because of that. Not going to lie. Jason Frankenstein? Doesn't roll off the tongue. No. (laughs) It It doesn't grab me. Yeah, there are new Frankenstein adaptations being made literally all the time. I mean, it's a good story. Yeah, it's great. So some things to to read if you like Frankenstein. There is so much. There's so much. But here's a couple of mine that I really highly recommend. Mm -hmm. Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. We've Mm -hmm. talked about it a lot today. If you read both, you'll understand why they're they're extremely similar. Mm -hmm. 
Ah. <laughs> <laughs> the Complete Tales of Edgar Allan Poe. Oh. Also. Ooh. Yes. Ooh. That could be an episode. That could be fun. Um, I would especially recommend The Mask of the Red Death and The Cask of Amontadillo. Oh, that's my favorite. Yes. Great so ones. good. So those two, Dracula by Bram Stoker, obviously got a pretty similar sort of theme. And based off The Vampire by John Polidari. Right. Slash. Feels like we talked about that Lord a million Byron. years ago now. Yeah, I know, right? It was literally like two hours ago. <laughs> And uh, a book called Perfume by Patrick Suskind. Oh, okay. It's a read, it's a translated one. It wasn't originally in English. It's about a murderer who follows, like, smells. I actually didn't, like, love it a lot, but it is really, really mm-hmm. similar to Frankenstein for me. Cool. It's kind of interesting. And then my last one, because I can't go multiple episodes without mentioning the OG Peggy Margaret Atwood, you should read Oryx and Crake. Oh, what is that? Uh, Orcs and Crake is like a... Is she your literary love? She is my literary love. Yeah. I'm glad we got to mention them both in Mm -hmm. this episode. I know. Orcs and Crake is sort of like a... So, I'm not really understanding Oryx. O-R-Y-X. Okay. They're extinct. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And that plays a part in the whole... It's about man's dominance over genetic capabilities. Oh, okay. So, thematically goes along with Frankenstein. This has been such a fun episode. So fun, you guys. Michaela, I'm having so much fun. Me too. We have highly enjoyed ourselves. I got really, really interested in the life of Mary Shelley. So I have some books I'd like to recommend. The YA biography book they mentioned earlier called Mary's Monster. Can't recommend that enough. It's beautiful. There's a really good nonfiction long form book called The Monsters. And that's about sort of the influences on her there are a lot of books about the science like i think it's called like making of the monster frankensteins Mm -hmm. there's even a picture book that is super beautiful called mary who wrote frankenstein that i can't recommend enough because it's beautiful (laughs) and with that thank you for joining us on this heavy hitter of an episode and happy halloween everyone from the community library network and boop I think it's safe no, to No, no, no. Spo- not spoiling the end of Frankenstein. We spoiled the end of The Invisible Man. I don't care. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. I, You're the one editing this one, so I, I know, can't so just... You can't you'll just cut it out even if I out. say it. God, fine. I'm moving on. I'm still mad at you. I know. I'm not... I'm ignoring it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not resolved about this. No. Get over no, it. No, just tell me why you won't spoil it. I, no, just tell him. <laughs> just tell him. So, Dr. Frankenstein dies, and the creature is on the boat now. That's not even what I was talking about. What are you talking <laughs> What are you talking about? I was talking about on their wedding night, like he thinks that he's going to die and oh, the he kills Elizabeth. Kills Elizabeth instead. Yeah. Oh, I was talking about the very end. Yeah, I was not talking about that. It's kind of like a Harry Potter versus Voldemort thing, like neither can live while the other survives. I'm Fight to the death. Ask you this later, but why does Voldemort have such a thing against Harry Potter? Are you kidding me? I'm sorry, I got so mad at you. I, thank you. There's been a lot of ups and downs. Ups and downs. I got mad at you. We got in a fight. You were so mad at me. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Flames on the side of my head. Oh my god, you guys. She was so upset with me. It was great. I hope you keep that all in.